Uh, okay. Uh, now uh, it's time of our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Jose Francisco Rodriguez uh, from uh, uh, Lisbon. Please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, um, and my best regard to Professor Raltseva, Professor Zolnikov, that I presume is also there. I'm very, very pleased to be here with you today. It's a great, great honor um, to be the first speaker in the, this occasion of the centennial of the great, great mathematician, Professor uh, Ladizhinskaya, that I an honor that started about uh, in 1995, when for the first time I was in St. Petersburg giving a talk in, in the seminar at Steklov. But uh, I had the opportunity to, to have, uh, even very late already, was I have the opportunity to have uh, several uh, meetings with her. And uh, uh, it's a pity that, of course, she cannot be today with us, but certainly she is with us in our memories. This is a great, great honor that I do not deserve, but since uh, Alexander Nazarov and Darit Pushkishkaya convinced me to, 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 to and gave me the honor to open this, this meeting, uh, which unfortunately I can attend in person by these unfortunate times that we live. Um, but now this time we already read certainly my, my abstract. My abstract is um, the abstract of a play, joint paper with Lucio Bucardo and Rita Cirmi, two Italian colleagues with who I have worked this problem, which is a classical problem, which is now published in this, in the, we have the reference to analytic and parabolic equations we have already done. And uh, uh, in this work, we revisit a classical problem, a classical problem that practically it could be so solved already, uh, with the techniques that are ex uh, developed or at least exp uh, exposed in the classical book by um, Leginsky and Duraltsev on elitic problems in 1964. Also, some ideas, of course, came later. The techniques are the basic and classical techniques to attack the, the second order uh, elitic operator with the uh, measurable coefficients that we we'll see. And in fact, the, uh, let me just, uh, the class of linear operator that I'm dealing with is the linear operator, which has a principal part of second order with a, uh, with a measurable definite positive matrix MX, which is strictly positive, elliptic, and these coefficients are bounded, just measurable coefficients, it's a classical framework. But we have a, a term, a convective term, a convective term which is in general non-coercive. And the novelty here is exactly what is the minimal assumption on this vector field E um, that provide us with the classical results that were known for the coercive case, even for more general and uh, more general operators with other no lower, no first order and zero order terms that I do not consider here. We consider the Dirichlet problem, and of course the classical uh, H1 zero sublevel space. <clears throat> the main new novelty is exactly to see that this can be, I mean, the classical theory can still be developed in particular for the obstacle problem, which is the con main concern of my talk today, with just a vector field uh, E, which is in the optimal space. We consider the case n larger than two, but of course, n equal two could be equally considered provided it is in L, um, in LP for any P larger than one, or even the one dimensional case with E in L1. But the interesting case is exactly the n larger or equal than three, and the optimal regularity is this one. In fact, the remark that this is the optimal regularity is due to the Sobolev inequality, as you know, and of course, uh, this is the, the right uh, space to, to have the, the variational formulation with uh, the solution in H10 and test function also in H10. And uh, in fact, this remark is already in the book I mentioned by Legendsky and the Ralph in 1964. 
where, of course, the, this theory, theory was developed in a comprehensive way for the first time. Of course, it had some developments later. The main concern was regularity theory. I will not deal with regularity theory today. I will deal today essentially with the issue of, of um, existence of the solution, because this is the minimal assumption, and as well as the comparison and uniqueness results. In fact, uh, the comparison has been already uh, known since the times of Tampakia from 65, under this assumption that the divergence, so this is my notation, sorry, the, my notations are, uh, I use the D for the gradient and the D dot for the divergence. And in fact, under this assumption, which is uh, a, a compatible classical assumption, which is compatible with the classical maximal principle, it's the divergence of the vector field E, is uh, non-negative. I take that uh, note that you have here sine minus, minus, usually with plus is the opposite sign, of course. With this assumption, Stampaki already observed that the, 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 this operator was, in a certain sense, coercive, and then the maximum principle applied. So the main uh, contribution today is to see what we can do just with this assumption without the classical uh, restriction on the divergence of the vector field E. And in fact, um, the, what I'm going to, to, to show you is that uh, the classical theory can be equally developed for uh, this operator, which is non-coercive. It is not any more monotone operator. It's a pseudo-monotone operator. It's linear. And uh, the main, main issue, main, main results are, say, could be stated in classical theory. I mean, under these assumptions, the, these minimal assumptions, um, the problem is, um, Sorry, uh, something is uh, um, missing here, is here. Sorry, I, I jump one slide. Uh, I mean, the problem is to extend the existence not only for the Rishi problem, but also, and this was already done a couple of years ago by Lucio Bucardo himself, but to extend all this uh, setting to the obstacle, one obstacle or two obstacles, problem. And in fact, the starting with the lower obstacle problem, I mean, this is a variation of quality. So as you remember, the, the operator A has two parts, the principal part and the convective part, non-coercive non part is this one. And we, we write the variation of quality for the obstacle problem with a convex set, which is a, a non-empty convex set of H1 Hilbert space, of functions which are bounded below by this given function in H10 to which is the obstacle. This is the lower obstacle problem. So we put the obstacle below as an index, but equally we could consider somehow the symmetric problem with the, with upper obstacle, which of course if obstacle is above or as well, we can also consider the two obstacle problems. So in a certain sense, the intersection of the two convex sets, which is naturally the, 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 the sets of function in H10 that are constrained by, by the two obstacles. Of course, this requires a compatibility condition. And in fact, uh, this problem has been this classical problem always under this assumption. In fact, Botaro already considered, sorry, Bot Botaro considered already in 75. And you can read in my book, this is also a notebook. You can also read the, this theory with uh, additional terms in addition. So the, the classical theory now reads as we expect. I mean, under these assumptions, which are minimal, uh, there exists a unique solution. Uh, to the upper obstacle, lower obstacle, or the two obstacles problem. We treat, uh, I mean, as a model problem, the lower obstacle, but uh, with minor changes, with the simpler adaptation for two, two obstacle problems, you can also have the same property. And the main, uh, the existence is based, I will explain that how the proof uh, in a minute, but uh, the uniqueness is a consequence of this uh, comparison principle, a kind of weak maximal principle that the operator processes, even being pseudo monotone, not monotone, just with this, this non coercive term. And in fact, we coin in a in more general form a definition to say that this operator A has this property, which is a new property. Uh, 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 which is adapted to these kind of uh, pseudo operate pseudo monotone operators that we call weakly thin monotone, which means that um, in a certain sense, if we um, uh, make this duality of the operator with a H10 function with this truncation, so we introduce this classical operator with this truncation by H, 
So you, you keep the, the, the identity if the value, the argument of the function is smaller or equal than h, and you just truncate by h or minus h if his name is small. We use the usual notation for the positive part, negative, the soup of S0 and negative part. Uh, and in fact, uh, the weekly T monotone is this definition. I mean, if this, uh, for any function in H0, if this property holds for any positive constant H, then necessarily, necessarily the solution must be no negative. And in fact, uh, an interesting property that this pseudo monotone non coercive operator, linear operator satisfies is exactly this property that we call weekly T monotone. I will explain why we call this this, this is a generalization of the strict T monotonicity introduced by Bridges and Sampaki in 69. But this property is satisfied only under this minor assumption on the integrability. In fact, it is even less than LL, just with L2, it's enough. And of course, uh, for any larger than, uh, than three, of course, this is, of course, uh, satisfied. The operator is T monotone. This gives us a kind of um, monotonicity property, I mean, comprising property, and consequently also the uniqueness of the solution without that restriction on the sign of divergence. In fact, uh, these are the two main results to, to adapt all the classical theory that then can develop, in particular, the Levis and Pax inequality for this class of, of um, non monotone problems, I mean, non monotone operators, so the monotone operators. And in fact, the, as I was telling you, the, the notion of T monotone operator was introduced by Bayston Packing in the well known paper in 68, so it's a very old notion that is related to the weak maximum principle and other properties of these uh, operators. Usually, this was done for monotone operators, I mean, the T. Uh, strict T monotonicity, which is a, a variant of this definition, implies the monotonicity of the operator. So our non-coercive operator, so the monotone operator cannot be T monotone, but it can. It is weak T monotone, as I explained. The corollary is this comprising principle, which is quite classical, quite standard, uh, but has this um, is a consequence of this weakly. T monotonicity, which means that in obstacle problem, I mean, if you have forces that are comparable and are comparable in this way, obstacles that are also comparable in the same direction, the, the, up, the lower obstacle, the upper obstacle, of course, in the case of two obstacles, you need to have the compatibility conditions such that convex set is not empty, then the solutions keep the order. I mean, the order is kept by, for the two solutions. Uh, this is the monotonicity result. It, of course, immediately implies uniqueness. And this is a consequence of the weak T monotonicity extending to pseudo monotone operators. But this concept uh, also allows to go a little further, in particular to uh, introducing this notion that was related also to the obstacle problem, which is the super solution of the obstacle problem, which means essentially that uh, if we have, um, so I, I recall the definition that uh, in the lower obstacle problem that we call the problem a k phi this variation of quality so a is the this this this, this operator k is the convex set which can be one of these three but i shall basically concentrate on lower obstacle problem so the psi is the the lower obstacle and f is of course the this this uh, ex external uh, um, uh, term so basically uh, the notion of super solution is also classical from the beginning of the obstacle problem. And in fact, it uh, is well known result by Stampaki from the 60s of the last century that the, the lower obstacle problem is in fact the lowest of the super solutions of the, of the obstacle problem. Of course, the solution uh, retains the notion which are the same for the equations, but in addition, adds of course the fact that the solution uh, the super solution must be, of course, a greater or equal than the obstacle, and the boundary also larger or equal than zero because we are dealing with homogeneous Dirichlet problem, Dirichlet condition. And of course, um, in certain sense, uh, this is the natural generalization for super solutions to the obstacle problem, and uh, we can have this kind of property, which in a certain sense was uh, uh, classical for the coercive uh, second order operator, that uh, is also a corollary of the weak. Um, T monotonicity for the pseudo monotone operator. 
Uh, this is um, in particular for when uh, for the the, uh, the maximum of the two super solutions is also two super solution, and the solution of the lower obstacle problem is 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 all is um, is below any super solution, and the, the infimum of two super solutions is a super solution, which is also consequence a classical consequence that can be extended to this operator. So. Uh, another in, very important consequence of this concept of timodonicity for the monotone operators, which is now extended to the weak timodonicity, is what is called Levis Tampak's inequalities, which were also introduced in the end of, well, already in the 70s by Levis Tampak for the Laplacian first, and then was extended for several classes of operators, linear, no linear, even for the Sumerian problem, is kind of Levis Tampak exists as well for the Neumann problem. But in fact, it requires that in fact, not only the, the force, I mean, the, the non-homogeneous term, but as well as the, the operator of the obstacle lies in the dual order dual of the uh, H1 zero. And the order dual, as you may know, is the um, difference of the two positive cones uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in the dual space H minus one. And in fact, if uh, both are uh, in the order dual, uh, then the, we can, uh, well, this inequality is always satisfied in the optical problem. The dual uh, inequality is the so-called levis impact inequality is, the, is this one, it's for, for, for the lower obstacle. And this somehow reduces the problem if this is duality, in duality sense. So in, in the dual of the H minus one, so it's in, H, it's in H minus one sense. And in fact, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, this is for the lower obstacle, for the, obst for the upper obstacle, in a certain sense, is the, the symmetrical, so we, we change the role of uh, F, and the, the, here is the soup, here is the inf of these two operators in the dual sense, in the dual. But for the two obstacles, it was already observed in a special case and can be extended to, to our pseudo-monotone operators as well, that we have a, a kind of combination of the two. I mean, in fact, we have the two inequalities, uh, but of course now we also require that the, 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 the operator applied to both obstacles are in the order dual, and you have these inequalities. In fact, this has been already observed in 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 in, um, in abstract framework, not only in Hilbert spaces, but even in more general ordered Banach spaces by by Moscow. And in fact, this is a consequence for monotone operators of the T monotonicity. And what, what we have shown here is that this is also a consequence of the weak T monotonicity if the operator is pseudo monotone with this minimal regularity. And in fact, as a consequence, the importance of these life and localities is the regularity. I have no, it's not the purpose of this work because we are working with minimal regularity on the coefficients. Nevertheless, uh, we can apply now the, the regularity theory, the Stampak, uh, and others estimates that have been proved uh, that we can have extra regularity on the solution in, in, in LPs or in uh, L infinity, even provided the, the, the vector field is a little bit more regular than just the, the LN case that we start just from the existence. In any case, uh, the importance is that the Levis impact inequality says that you can reduce the problem to the regularity of the, of the equation, not uh, in, in an obstacle problem. And in fact, uh, for this non coercive uh, uh, operator A, this has been already this has been proved by Bucardo recently, in fact, not. Okay. Um, in this paper, we also complete with some classical theory concerning the stability of the obstacle problem for Moscow conversions. In fact, uh, if the, the operator is monotone, this is uh, quasi standard, but our problem, our operator is only pseudo monotone and is non coercive. So it is an extra co co convective term that is needed to control, but it can be controlled. And basically, what we are able is to extend the classical stability in respect to the Moscow conversions. So I just recall here the definition, it was a classical definition for conversion of convex sets that works in a very, very general framework of Banach spaces. But if you take uh, the convex defined by, by obstacles, this relies on some uh, conversions of the obstacles themselves. And there are here lists of well-known properties that imply the most conversions. And in fact, if this convex, I mean, the, 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 there is a continuous dependence strongly in H1 zero, 
And in fact, the fact that the operator is not coercive requires a little extra work to prove the, the strong coercions, but it's a certain sense uh, expected was uh, because it's classical already. And this works as well for the two obstacle, which is uh, a variation, uh, uh, I mean, the consequence also of the weak T monotonicity. As an application of this Moscow stability, uh, we can give an example of uh, implicit obstacle problem, which corresponds to quasi variation equality. I go quickly here because now this, this, this we make just the machine working, but you must be careful with this uh, uh, new component, this non, non, the non coercive part of the operator, which you need to control, but it is possible to control. For instance, as an example, when the, so the quasi variation means the convex depends on the solution itself. This is a notion that was introduced already in the 70s by Bessens and Jones and was developed later on. And in fact, uh, we need to give some kind of uh, functional dependence of the obstacle with respect to the solution. And of course, to make the proper assumptions for giving an example, which was motivated by a semiconductor problem, but I do not have time to enter into, into details. And we can give an existence uh, result. In general, there are no uniqueness in these quasi variational problems, but we may have existence of solutions for these kind of couple uh, quasi-variational problems, also with non-coercive operators. Now, um, I, let me just give you a flavor of the what is the novelty here. The technique is uh, extension to the obstacle problem, a technique that was already used by Bucardo for the Dirichlet problem, which is somehow make a, a nonlinear approximation of this uh, convective term. You know that uh, for n, any natural number, so n is here uh, destined to tend to, inf to infinity, so this term will disappear in the limit, basically, and we get the classical problem. I mean, you, you remember here in this line below, we want to solve this problem with k lower obstacle, upper obstacle, or two obstacles. I just take as an example, uh, working with the lower obstacle, and there are minor adaptations uh, for the upper obstacle and uh, a little bit more careful with the two obstacles, but we're still working basically with the same uh, ideas with some technical uh, adaptations. But basically, the point is to make approximation. Of course, in general, it's not even necessary to show that uh, the, there is a weakness of solution, but there the, the, the exists at least one solution. And this is not too difficult because you see, this is bounded. This is bounded. So by a fixed point, the shoulder fixed point is not difficult because once you know how to solve, how to solve the, how to solve the, the, the problem with the given f, the l is the is the is the principal part. So the, it's monotone and strictly coercive. So if you just insert here a, a function in h10. This function uh, actually is, uh, uh, is, uh, is this term is bounded, so uh, this becomes uh, um, a well posed uh, fixed point, uh, shallow, shallow fixed point argument. Uh, and you can really uh, prove there is at least one solution. The main issue is to prove that the solution is as this bound. You are in the bounded domain of Rn, so by Poincaré, it is sufficient to take just this a priori estimate. This a priori estimate gives a little bit of work, of work. I will explain later, but suppose that we can prove this to, to this, this estimate, then the process is more or less standard because then you can take a subsequence converging immediately in H10, strongly converging H1. Uh, recall that we are solving this problem already in the convex set. So by this conversion, so almost everywhere at least, it's sufficient to say that this limit is in this convex, because it's a closed, it's a closed convex set of H1 zero. So we, it is here. Uh, what we need to, to show is that when you let n here, we can let n go to infinity and to obtain the what you want. To, that is a solution of this, of this uh, limit problem. In fact, the, basically the thing that you need to control is that, well, the first part is just a lower SME continuity and we con so it's classical. The only thing that is necessary to control is basically this term because we have the minimal regularity in this term E. And in fact, uh, the trick here is, is to use the truncation functions again, sorry. Using again truncation functions and uh, testing 
testing the approximating problem with the uh, test function, which is un minus the truncation of un minus w, where w is an arbitrary function in the convex. And then uh, we need to, to, to basically to take into account what happens with, uh, with these uh, the convective terms. But basically using this identity uh, and using the fact uh, that uh, we have this identity if uh, uh, the truncation does not act, as you know, if uh, the, the truncation is the identity if you are below k. And, um, and in, if you are above k, the derivative is zero. So we just need to, 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 to see that when we have this gradient here, we are restricting to, to, to the set, to, to this set, integrating in only in omega of this uh, point where this is satisfied. And in fact, the, since we have, uh, we can pass to the limit from here to here, this, uh, using semi-continuity of this, this principal part, the perceived part. And um, then we can also, since k is arbitrary, you can let k go to infinity, and you know this converts from h one zero. So from here, and this is essentially equal to this by this property. Then passing to the limit here, we get immediately that this weak limit is in fact our solution. So the existence basically is this, provided we have this a priori estimate. And in order to have this a priori estimate, we need to work a little bit because this is all the key. Of course, and the, uh, again, the, the proof of this a priori estimate is in, done in two parts. The first part is relatively easy. So we introduce this the, 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 the complement of the truncation. We call it GK. So the identity is TK plus GK. Okay, so in order to estimate the, the gradient, we need to estimate the gradient of this plus the gradient of this. The estimate of the first of the of the t is, um, is 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 okay. It's not so difficult because you can take as a test function exactly the un here can take uh, as v here can take the test function un minus tk, and this gives you first. Uh, developing the terms gives you these terms, and basically uh, we can apply um, using the, the minimal regularity on E. Can apply basically uh, the Young inequality and take this term on the because you have also the coercivity here because you just integrate when u minus u n minus psi is more than k, and you can use the strict ellipticity of the principal part, and you can just have. Uh, the existence of one constant for any k. Okay, this is simple. This is first part. A little less uh, uh, is a little bit more complicated. Is the the, the complement this gk, and using to gk we go again choosing v now as given by this. This is also admissible test function. You can simply do this easily, and uh, using. Um, this, ident this, this, this identity for any n, you can just uh, uh, plug Vn in this, sorry, and you get this inequality. This inequality, uh, well, it gives you a little bit more work to control each term. And uh, it requires, in fact, some, uh, some, uh, some property that we'll see, because this is what we need to estimate. We obtain this. And now, using the subway of inequality in order to control uh, this term, we can put this uh, with this. This is subway of constant. Uh, we can put this on the on the left hand side. But we need now to make this to be strictly positive in order to control this term because everything on the right is controlled. But we need basically because this is uh, this is quadratic. This is linear. So. Um, basically, the main point is to see that this is positive. Say, for instance, that this term is uh, for k sufficiently large, it is more than alpha over two. This is already the bound that we need for for the remaining term. And in fact, combining the two, we shall get our our aim, which is a priori bound. And in fact, this is possible because because uh, in fact we have this inequality. This inequality shows that, in fact, the measure of this set tends to zero when k tends to infinity, which means that we can make this as small as you wish for k large. And, uh, and in fact, uh, this is also something that requires some 
some extra work, and I give you just an idea because I have no much time to explain all this, but this is the, the main part that, of course, Bucardo developed for the Dirichlet problem, and now it is here extended also for the obstacle. In fact, the obstacle, you need to check carefully that using, again, this test function, you can have this property with the log, just using the fact that uh, um, this is related to, 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 to the log and the bunker. And in fact, uh, um, when you have the log, you can minimize by, 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 by K. So we can have this estimate. And uh, of course, you can check all details in, in the paper in the version I, I said. So I, I, since I have little time, I, and I want also to explain the main idea, the main proof of the um, of the team monotonicity, because it is also one of the novelties here, is that in fact why the operator is weakly T monotone. So this is the proof of the theorem two. The proof of theorem two basically is using is also using a clever argument that was used already in this type of operators, but in a different framework. Uh, but nevertheless, it works here exactly with this this extra term. So here is in fact equivalent to this because this is the principal part, the coercive part. This is the, the convective non-coercive part. With the, and then basically what we need to do that here, as you can see, using the strong ellipticity, you get this term. And here we just take the the, the value v plus, so it's exactly the integral only on this set. You just apply uh, Schwartz with H because the solution is uh, the UV is always smaller than H, and you get H here, uh, which is naturally important. And then using Poincare, you go from here to here with Poincare constant here is this P constant, positive constant. And you just take now a delta which is larger than H. And this, uh, then you can just minimize this by this measure of this set, take the square root, and basically. Now letting h going to zero, you see that the measure of this set is zero for any. Uh, sorry, there is some misprint here. Probably this now yes, when this this is zero, which means that in fact uh, v. Um, I think this is a misprint here. Uh, implies that v is more or equal than zero because measure of the set. Uh, yeah, no, no, because the set of measure of when it's positive, it is zero, so it must be non-negative. That's right. That's correct. So this is basically the argument that proves that operator is T monotone, is weakly T monotone, which remains to control this part that destroys the monotonicity, but is under control with this with this argument. Okay. Now uh, the comprising is basically a standard argument using now with test functions using again the truncation. The difficulty is novelty is not not very new. This is just comparing the using test functions in the variation equalities and then. You see that this making this the, this um, addition, you get this inequality. H is arbitrary, so the definition of the weak monotonicity is exactly what we need to conclude the the the, the, the comprising conclusion. Well, when I was preparing this talk, I had uh, I check and I proved that all these results for the linear non-coercive operator still work for a quasi-linear pseudo-monotone non-coercive of this type. So we can generalize the principal part by a strongly elliptic um, quasi-linear operator in H10. So I just work in the Hilbert framework. Could be possible, probably, but I've not checked all details for WNP for P is more than two, but basically this works for P equal two, sorry. And again, a convective term, a convective term that is um, Lipschitz continues in U and has a linear growth, linear growth, just controlled by also this minimal property. And if I have the opportunity to write these remarks, I will dedicate these new results to the memory of the Professor Lijanskaya. And here ends my mathematical comp component and uh, my talk. But if you allow me just to to give um, my uh, give you a little bit of memories that I share with you of uh, Professor Lisinskaya during her visit to Portugal in 2003. Actually, the last visit abroad, you know, where she, in fact, she was in three conferences already quite uh, a late age. She was first 
in, um, in she, was, she was in spring, the end of spring. The end of spring in Lisbon, you have these beautiful jacarandas, and she liked very much flowers, as you can and you know better than me that she likes very much flowers. This is a picture taken by my colleague Adelia Sequeira, also from my university the, in, in Sintra, uh, where she, when she visits. And uh, she was coming for the uh, conference in Obidus. It's a medieval town about 80 kilometers uh, northwest of Lisbon, where uh, there is a wall. And I remember that in 2003, Professor Lijinskaya went to the top of this wall. And the top of this wall, this is the view. And there are 50, 50 steps. And this is, of course, the photograph of the group. And she was able to go there and enjoy the view. In fact, it was also enjoyable this dinner. The dinner dot was the 70th birthday in the 8th of June of 2003 of Professor Onikov. Uh, I don't know if you are seeing this picture, Professor Onikov, but uh, you may remember well this dinner in my whole house in Obidus. And I remember I still keep very, very uh, near my books this little object that was the little. Uh, head egg in ceramics that uh, was offered to me by Professor Lysinsky. I keep it in my library. Then she moved, she visited a little bit of Portugal. She went to the most Western Cape of Europe, Cap de Roca. Uh, and you see there is a, a lighthouse and this is the, the most Western point of the European coast. Uh, then she went to Evra for another conference where Evra is uh, uh, a very beautiful city in the, in the east of Portugal, not very far from Spain. It's an old, very old city with Roman ruins, and he gave a talk there on Navia Stokes. You can see the equations. And finally, the third conference was also uh, on, the, on the sixth birthday of uh, my colleague, Uberon de Vega. I'm not sure if he's uh, may, may also remember that he was in Funchal in Madeira Island, and she here is. Uh, very happy to see all this beautiful view in this probably last conference, international conference that she attended. And with these uh, memories, um, uh, uh, Professor Lajinskaya, uh, I finished my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, if we have uh, time for uh, one or two questions. Okay. Uh, please stop your sharing, uh, Jose Francisco. Sorry. Uh, stop sharing, please. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. For, for a moment. Uh huh. Uh, так. А вы этот самый галерея. Okay, no. Uh, yeah, uh, in fact, I have a question, but I uh, don't have brains now. Uh, I hope uh, to ask you after the conference. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. Uh, now, uh,